It's great to welcome to the program today, Greg Kassar, a native Texan, son of Mexican immigrants, community organizer and Democratic congressman for the 35th district in Texas, which includes both San Antonio and Austin, Texas. Uh, it's really great to have you on. It's good to meet you. I, I wish it were under sort of better circumstances. The votes are still being counted as far as the House of Representatives goes. We know that Democrats have lost the Senate. We know that um, not by a small margin, uh, Kamala Harris has lost the presidential election. So I want to just start with your diagnosis of what happened, depending on whether you listen to Bernie Sanders or Simone Sanders, no relation whatsoever. They just both happen to have the last name Sanders. Very different interpretations as to what happened. Is it a candidate issue? Is it an electorate issue? Is it a messaging issue? Was it the wrong vice president? Where is your head right now on what happened? Where my head is right now is that, of course, if you have a Republican Party that has been entirely dominated by uh, by MAGA, completely in bed with billionaire interests, spreading constant lies, of course, you've got a formidable opponent and we can't take the blame off of them. But that doesn't look like it's going to change anytime soon. So I think the question isn't a blame game. The question is, how can the Democratic Party successfully defeat that kind of propaganda and authoritarianism and constant lies? And the way for us to do it, I think, is to make sure we build out a message that puts working people's economics first. And, and so in that way, um, I do think that what Senator Bernie Sanders and others have been saying for quite a while about bringing together people across geography, across uh, race, but also, frankly, across ideologies around a working people's agenda first makes a lot of sense. Now, what I do think Senator Sanders has said, but sometimes people uh, misunderstand or mischaracterize, and I, I didn't hear what Simone Sanders said. She's I also admire and appreciate her. But what I think also can't get lost is that doesn't mean throwing civil rights or vulnerable people under the bus in the process. In fact, I think what that means is having a big tent, a huge tent on economic issues that brings together all sorts of people saying, we're the folks putting your pocketbook first that are willing to stand up to billionaires and corporate price gougers. But we also are for civil rights. We also happen to not be bigots, but we cannot um, any longer, I think, uh, have a Democratic Party brand that isn't first about working people um, and that kind of economic populism that I think is necessary to defeat the level of lies we get, not just from Donald Trump, but being pumped out by people like Elon Musk. So let's take a couple of those things kind of one by one. I do think it's hard to deny that on the economic messaging, I mean, most people don't know that we had what 50 all time stock market highs during the Biden Harris administration already. I saw an interview with a voter, a bunch of young guys who said we're voting Trump because of high gas prices when gas prices are at their post pandemic low right now. And it's sort of a, a low that's been equaled three or four times since the pandemic. There's a lot of like check the fact stuff that seems to be kind of failing on the economic message. But to some of the other things you mentioned, uh, I just saw exit polling that among those who believe abortion should be legal in most cases among that group, they went 49 percent for Democrats, 49 percent for Republicans in this election. That seems inconceivable to me unless the propaganda is effective when Trump takes every side of abortion and says, thanks to me, Roe v. Wade was overturned, but actually it's great for states to do whatever they want. But if they do want to ban it, that's OK, too. I don't know how you fight against that, because 40 the, the pro choice vote split 49, 49 seems inconceivable to me. And that's part of what I was trying to say right at the beginning here. The fact is the propaganda does work. That's why they do it. Constant lying does work. Getting completely in bed with billionaires and having them spend untold amount of money sowing fear and division does work. It's the oldest trick in the authoritarian book. We aren't the only country that's dealt with this. This isn't the only time the United States has dealt with something similar to this. Of course, it's different in the modern era. Yes. So the question isn't, um, hey, what did Demo like? You know, how did Democrats totally fall apart on this? The question is, we have to be like 10 times better. And 
uh, I don't have, and I don't think any of us have time to complain about the fact that that's unfair. That's the fact. We have to be so much better because we have to tell the truth. We have to unite people and we have to deal with um, fighting back against this propaganda machine. And we just have to do it. And we have to do it in this coming election because we can't continue to lose elections. And I think the way to do it is to vote. Yes, we have to be the pro-choice party. But I believe that we lost, and you can see it in lots of states where, for example, abortion rights measures passed, or in the case of Florida, got well over 50%, but didn't right. reach the necessary 60% threshold, where there are certainly very pro-choice voters who said you know, that they were going to put that in the backseat or in second place or not prioritize it as much because they also uh, wanted to deal with those economic core economic issues. And to your point about gas prices, I think that it isn't, we, we cannot endure winning and losing elections to people like Trump just based on sort of one cycle to another where the gas price is or where the egg price is. I think they're looking for who is it that's on my side on this issue. And I think that that goes beyond any economic policy. It goes beyond any one campaign's message. It has to do with the Democratic Party brand. And I think the Democratic Party brand needs to be rethought and put back together as we are on your side on these issues, whether the, the price is up or down, whether unemployment is up or down in these different cycles, that we're on the side of good jobs and lower prices. And that that's what people think of first when they think of the Democratic P Party. And honestly, some of our own voters don't think of us that way first. And, and we've got to try to put that together, understanding that there's a right wing propaganda machine doing everything it can to make sure we don't sound like that. So one issue that I think is a little different along these lines, and it's very much an issue in your state of Texas relates to immigration, the Latino vote and mass deportations. Uh, the Texas Tribune reports that Trump got 55 percent of the Latino vote in Texas on Tuesday. Um, multiple polls show that more than half of Americans want mass deportations. They they like it. It's not I've been propagandized to or I don't understand. They just they're like, yes, I, I want that to happen. I think that that's a thing that that should happen as a Latino voter myself who moved to the U.S. legally. I want some permanent solution to DACA. I'm not interested in deportation camps and mass deportations like my, I did not vote for Trump and I have a particular view on this issue, but I can't ignore that. I hear from other Latino voters who say, listen, I came here legally. We need the mass deportations. I just like it. Like, I just want it to happen. I'm not confused. I haven't been propagandized to its policy. I like how do you win when that's the case? Look, I uh, believe not only that mass deportations are wrong, but I believe that um, and, and saw and experienced how just a few years ago when Donald Trump was last president and they were starting to undo basic um, civil rights when they were trying to push the state to be more involved in this kind of deportation and mass detention, that public opinion snapped back against that kind of hatred. So I don't think that voters have some kind of false consciousness and have just bought in, uh, bought into this. Mm. I think that it, we are. I think we have to recognize that people in the media and people that are in politics are also leaders. We're leaders, and that isn't just propaganda. We present who the villains are. We present who the heroes are. We present what the policy solutions are. And what was very clear from not just Donald Trump but the entire Republican Party is that they recognized that there was stress in the American public. Voters, a lot of voters, are stressed out. They have, you know, feeling wages stagnating compared to prices, see rising housing costs, you see worsening health care. And I do not believe that we had a consistent enough Democratic Party message that said, no, housing prices aren't going up because of immigrants. They're going up because of Wall Street. We didn't say clearly enough, hey, you're not dealing with stagnating wages because of immigrants. You're dealing with stagnating wages because of Elon Musk mm. and Jeff Bezos. We didn't say you are got this worsening health care issue because of immigrants. That's what we consistently heard from Donald Trump and his allies. We need to say that's because of special interests and the lobby in Washington, D.C. and big pharma. So if we don't, as Democrats, point out who the villains are, then we leave the field completely open for Trump to say it's immigrants' fault that things are more expensive. It's immigrants' fault that you're feeling economic stress. It's immigrants' fault that uh, the healthcare system is getting worse. But the fact is, 
They have nothing to do with any of that. You can't find a reliable study in any form. And it also isn't tr just, it just isn't true. So your question is, how do you defeat a constant barrage of clear lies? And I think the only answer that we can have is we have to be better at pointing out and telling the truth in a meaningful way. And I just don't think that that message got across um, and we have to do better at it. And uh, honestly, I think our message as a Democratic Party was like in 10 different places on those issues rather than clearly calling out um, who the villains are and not falling into the trap of saying that maybe immigrants are sort of the villains. And I just don't think that that works. It doesn't work. In fact, it doesn't work morally. And it turned out it didn't work electorally either. There are some in my audience who think that th part of the solution has to be the Democratic Party as a whole moves way to the left. These are often the folks who say Bernie would have won in 2016 and 2020 and 2024, who say that Kamala Harris sitting down all day with Liz Cheney at public events, no matter what the reason is, even if it's a defense of democracy rather than their view on abortion, it's it's a bad thing that uh, kind of playing, hey, we're, we are going to be serious on the border, just not quite as extreme as Trump. Right. There's the view that that's all a losing policy. Got to go way to the left. On the other hand, there are those who say I am very much with the Democratic Party on most social issues and on many economic issues. But I think that the border should be taken more seriously than maybe Kamala Harris took it. I think that crime in cities should be taken more seriously. And this, to be clear, is regardless of what the facts are about crime, right? We've talked about this endlessly on my program. This is just a positioning thing. These are very different views. Move way to the left or play a little more Republican light. What, what do you think? I think that there is a path that isn't just on that left right spectrum. Hmm. Um, and I believe that path means really meeting voters where they are with the truth and with a more populist and authentic sentiment. And uh, and to me, that doesn't mean that you are running way to the Republican center right or uh, or falling into uh, sort of the traps of of being seen as working on marginal issues rather than working people's general issues. And so I do think that on issues of safety, we can't tell people, hey, just because um, uh, crime is down, you just shouldn't worry about your safety anymore. We absolutely should be talking about people's safety and taking that seriously. And I think a real way of taking it seriously, for example, in Texas, is we know that there is, of course, cartel violence. But you know who the biggest pusher of cartel guns and cartel violence is? It's Republicans and people like Governor Greg Abbott here who have made it as easy as possible to get weapons of war into the hands of people without background checks. And when I meet with leaders of the Mexican government, for example, the first thing they bring up isn't immigration. It's our gun policies, because the majority of the guns that they get when they bust up a cartel come from the United States. And the overwhelming majority of those come from Texas. So I think we should be owning the public safety issue, but we don't have to own the public safety issue by sounding Republican. We can own the public safety issue by actually taking the fight to those Republicans themselves on issues of immigration. I think we can say, look, immigrants are good and we're going to defend our immigrant communities and we're going to stop letting there be people treated like second and third class citizens, which drive down wages for everyone. We should make sure that people who are here and have been here for 10 and 20 and 30 years are able to fully participate in society. And we should have an orderly and legal and humane situation at the border. And it's Republicans that have prevented that. And we should be able to go directly at that at that issue, because I'll tell you, people in Texas, the overwhelming number of people I talk to, including undecided voters, they aren't uh, at their at their heart upset with immigrants themselves. Of course, there are always going to be some people, but overwhelmingly people just say, look, the disorder that they see is concerning to them. And so how do we have an orderly system? Well, they would much rather see people be able to apply to be able to come here, have a legal process, have a, a thoughtful timeline, be able to escape devastation and add to our, our economy and to our culture here. I think people would buy into that, but we should call into call out People like Republican Attorney Ken Paxton here, Republican Attorney General K. 
Ken Paxton, who's constantly been, um, you know, a corrupt elected official, uh, impeached by his own Republican members of the Texas House for his corruption. He's trying to shut down not disorderly immigration. He's trying to shut down the legal processes for right. migration that the Biden administration tries to set up. So I think there is a way. And and if people want to, you know, I, I'm proudly a progressive Democrat. But if people want to call what I just said more to the center or more to the left, I don't I don't know what to call it. But what I'll tell you is we need include and I include my progressive brothers and sisters in this. We need a truthful message that I believe is a progressive message, but that's a majoritarian message, a popular message that brings together the, a large swath of voters. We can work on persuading voters our way. We can both persuade voters, lead voters, and hold together electoral majorities because we cannot be a minority party. A couple of quick ones just to see whether we're on the same page. The idea that Tim and, Walls, and the answer is I don't know yet fully yet. You know, we're figuring it out, but, but this of course, is the conversation course. we're trying to have. The the claim that Tim Walls was the problem for the Harris ticket and that Josh Shapiro would have led to different results. I don't believe it. I don't even think with Josh Shapiro, Harris wins Pennsylvania based on what the margin was. And I think the risk of of that is it brings out latent anti-Semitism. So I, I just don't think that the VP choice was the dispositive factor here. Do you agree? Yeah, I don't see I don't see how it is that, frankly, this entire thing gets solved in the hundred day campaign mm. that happened. Uh, I mean, to, to, to me, sure, we could Monday morning quarterback it and say, you know, if the vice president had done this or that or the or or if Governor Walls had done this or that, maybe if we really went in um, Monday morning quarterback, we could see how that could change some number of votes in some states and have losses in others. But at the end of the day, I don't think that this was something that was about the last 100 days or even the last 10 months. Well, me, if it should we, have we been more have than 100 days, should Biden have stepped aside earlier? Would that have helped Harris? You, I think, again, this, the, the going back and looking at, hey, what should the president have done? What should the vice president have done? I think the theory that I've laid out to you a little bit earlier stands stronger and truer if it actually doesn't have to do with those particular actors in those particular last months. I think we have a broader Democratic Party brand issue. Hmm. That then certainly people could go and look at what the president or vice president or what the campaign could have done to try to play a really bad hand a little better. But what I really want folks to focus on is why is it that we are playing from such a bad hand? Why is it that this kind of election was even close? Hmm. And I think that the more that people go and try to dissect that last, that la that last ditch few months part, we're missing talking about the bigger issue, which is why is it that folks think that a Democratic Party whose policies are about freedom in the workplace, freedom of health care, freedom to live how you'd like? Why is it that people don't hear those policies because there's just a general sense the Democratic Party is more, maybe more for the elite, maybe sometimes for the working class? Who knows? That's the core issue. If, if that was if that was fixed, then I think we'd have been in a completely different place. Uh, from the beginning. And, and I think digging into those decisions in those last few months, we end up missing, honestly, the forest for the trees. We've been speaking with Democratic Congressman Greg Kassar from Texas. Really appreciate your time and insights today. Thank you so much for having me.